Hello there, podcast listener. You are listening to What Scares Us, a podcast from the Ann Arbor District Library in Michigan, where four friends share the movies that make us all oogie and that we love to watch when we are cashing one big bastard of a check. (laughs) Oh, poo. I can't think of any words. Well, anyway, I'm Christopher, and I'm joined by three other staff members of the library. My name is Matt. I'm Allison. And I'm Amanda. And today we are watching Misery from 1990. First, I would like to go off script and ask everyone what they've been watching lately that's been really scary. Ooh. Hmm. Or supposed to be scary. Oh, I have one, but I've already told you guys about it. (laughs) Um, I loved the TV show Marianne on Netflix. And I was also um, thinking about it a lot because it's very like a very similar setup to this where an author who writes about this like ghostly presence called Marianne has to go back to her hometown because surprise, Marianne's real and she's just been like capitalizing on this like terrible thing that's haunting her town it's french so you gotta read subtitles but um i I gotta say the first couple episodes i was legitimately kind of freaked out which never happens for me so i would recommend that for sure right awesome i haven't watched much scary stuff as of late Uh, i you, I guess you could say that the Ken Burns documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, is scary <laughs> in its own way. Um, I have been, I've, I've been watching that. Um, and I watched uh, the majority of Bo is Afraid, which I think is a scary thing Ooh. in its own way. Um, but I haven't really been watching too much uh, true horror. I have, a, I have a list of stuff I'd like to get to, um, namely, most recently, Thanksgiving. Um, I just <laughs> I still haven't made time to watch that yet, but... That reminded me of one other thing I watched recently. It's not horror. It's a sci-fi movie. But, um, man, it really fucked me up. <laughs> it's called Aniara. Um, and it's about this, um, like, shuttle that goes from Earth to Mars is, um, like, accidentally goes off course. And it's about how mm-hmm. they all, like, uh, deal with that and try to get back to Mars. Cool. So, um, I will say, if you're not in a good headspace, don't watch it. <laughs> Um, you've been warned, but it really affected me. Interesting. It sounds like the outer space version of the descent. Kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be scary then. Yeah. I haven't consumed anything scary or horror related be a book or podcast or a movie. I've been watching a bunch of random reruns. I've been watching freaks and geeks lately. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a, terrifying. That's really hitting my, hitting my heart really lovely. Um, Love yeah, nothing show. spooky going on. Except for Misery. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mis- well, Misery, and then also, um, this will not be relevant at some point, but the trailer for the new Alien movie that actually looks like it could be good. Oh, does it? Yeah. It's oh. the I forget the director's name, but he's the guy that did Don't Breathe and the Evil Dead remake. Oh, Fede Alcaraz? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah. So there's a teaser trailer that doesn't show very much for a new Alien movie that actually looks like it. they like figured it out. And wow. Of, yeah. That's high praise coming from you. I <laughs> man, you I don't want to be wrong. I have felt aliens. this way so many fucking yeah. times in my life <laughs> since like I, I think since fifth grade. Oh, where I was man. like, Alien Resurrection, this movie's gonna be great. I just know it. And Aww. then and then betrayed. So hopefully hopefully this one's right, but we'll know come August. So All right. it sounds like the right attitude. When I saw yeah. the new movie was coming out, I was like, Oh gosh, I hope it's good enough for Matt. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm just glad we got our mandatory alien reference in this episode. <laughs> oh, sure, we sure, got sure. that out <laughs> early. There will be more. I, all, I have one more. written down. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get into misery from nineteen ninety. First of all, this movie stars Kathy Bates and James Caan and Vice President of the Ice Queen Hottie Society, Lauren Bacall. What? (laughs) That's a little club that my phantasm brother and I made up. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. 
So it's directed by Rob Reiner, and this is the second time that Rob Reiner and Stephen King have collaborated. I think Stephen King called Stand By Me the best screen adaptation ever of his work. Mm -hmm. So Rob Reiner had a string of top movie hits, just to give you some background. This is Spinal Tap, The Sure Thing, Stand By Me, Princess Bride, When Harry Met Sally, of course, Misery that we're talking about today, A Few Good Men, and then came North, <laughs> which Roger Ebert called one of the worst <laughs> movies ever made. But we're not talking about that. It's a pretty impressive run that Rob Reiner had. And Rob Reiner is also collaborating again with William Goldman, who he worked with on Princess Bride. William Goldman made so, he did the screenplay for so many movies, Butch Cassidy, Stepford Wives, Marathon Man, oh. Magic, of course, The Princess Bride, and Misery. And All the President's Men. And All the President's Men. Wow. So this, uh, I would be disappointed if this movie went wrong. <laughs> and in my taste, it does not go wrong. So let's go around the room and find out what everyone's initial impressions are of the movie and whether this is the first, second, third time watching it. Uh, I don't know how many times I've seen this movie. I've seen this movie a bunch. Um, I, I saw it multiple times before I eventually read the book. I think I read the book. I Let me reference my little list here. I think I read the book in 2022 for the first time. Um, and I've seen the movie several times since then. <laughs> I like this movie a lot. Um, I always have. Uh, it's. I don't think I've ever been scared of it, uh, but reading the book actually really enhanced my level of fear with it. I don't know. It's. It's. I love this movie. There's a lot to like, and um, if if nothing else, holy cow, Kathy Bates in this movie is is like unstoppable. She's so good. Um, as I said last episode, for me, Stephen King is mostly books. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I had seen this before, but I honestly am not sure because I don't have like a solid memory of like sitting down and watching it. Um, it's possible I saw some of it on TV, but I think what is more likely is um, I feel like I've probably seen certain scenes in like those like 50 best horror movie moments mm -hmm. or like other um, things like that. Totally. Um, but I do love the book. I read it a bunch in middle and high school. I actually own three copies of this book. Um, and I brought one to show you guys today um, once we get into the actual story of it. But yeah, I think this is great. I love this story. And I think this is like one of the few amazing adaptations of Stephen King's work. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm a big Stephen King fan, but I, I connect his books and his movies. I enjoy both of them separately. I do like to compare and contrast, but it's hard to, I feel like you have to view them as separate entities. I was probably in ninth grade when the movie came out and I don't remember the first time I saw it. I'm sure it was on in the house. We watched a lot of like nineties. Like this would have been more of like a thriller or a drama kind of like silence of the lambs was. So I've seen it a bunch of times when I was younger. Um, I didn't read the book by Stephen King until about five months ago. I read it during spooky season and that was my first time reading it. And I think it's a good one to read because it's one of his shorter ones. I got, there are some differences in it, but m the main difference that bogged me down was the narration of parts of the book series Misery are in it. And I mm -hmm. just did not like the, that part. Um, so for me, the movie was like, is refreshing because that part is different. You couldn't really have done that in the movie. I really liked the movie. Kathy Bates was phenomenal. Um, so we also really loved the movie growing up in my house, Fried Green Tomatoes, and she was in that. So for us, I feel like she's a 90s staple actress even though this was like her first breakout role which she won an oscar for best actress and the golden glow for best actress which is pretty amazing and stephen king did put this in his um list of top 10 favorite adaptations of his material which is pretty cool so i was excited to um that christopher picked it because i've already picked my one stephen king thing for this show so. <laughs> why but, only one 
Well, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I could do it all the time, but we got to, you know, have some variety. <laughs> sure. um, but I will say, Christopher, I'm excited that Misery is the pick for, this is our 19th episode. And 19 is a number you'll find, particularly in the Dark Tower series, but it pops oh. up in various things in Stephen King's Oh, works. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So it's a little, yeah. That's great. I've only read the first five pages of The Gunslinger, so. Oh, I'm, I'm not, I will never be reading or watching. Well, I tried to watch and I didn't, couldn't do it, but. Oh, the apparently that's where the big references started. <clears throat> gotcha. So I don't know. I think I started to read Dark Tower, the first novel, or Gunslinger, and doesn't Stephen King have a whole prologue about writing and fantasy writing and how he wanted to do it his way, and everyone else is, was just doing a knockoff of Tolkien, and he names particular authors who he finds to be just doing cheesy knockoffs of fantasy. Yeah. And that really turned me off. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you're at the, you know, you're at the top and you're knocking people who are not around anymore. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I think he had a little bit of a chip on his shoulder because um, I think part of, I forget what interview I was reading, but um, part of why he wrote this book is because he was feeling very like pegged into like I am a horror writer and he wanted to write fantasy or like other genres and people were like sort of pigeonholing, pigeonholing him into like just this one genre that he had already been successful in. So, um, yeah, I could see why he'd be like, well, fuck this. Let me do what I want. Right. <laughs> when did The Dark right. Tower come out? The book. 82 the first one the first I don't know. one man for me even idris alba could not i tried to watch if there's a oh. book i know i'm not going to read i've tried to watch at least the film adaptations of stephen king and i was like oh cool and i love idris alba and i'm like yay and i'm like nope halfway through turned it off and done i from <laughs> what i understand about that that mm -mm. movie that is like a, it is universally hated especially yeah. by people that were like a lot of his fans maintain that the dark tower stuff is his absolute best and i've heard I haven't read any of them yet, but my understanding is that The Gunslinger is like a slog and it's hard to get through. And oh. if I remember correctly, I might be wrong. And if I am, I'll, I'm going to take this out. <laughs> um, I thought that The Gunslinger was published almost like The Green Mile was, where it was in, uh, oh, little like chunks. in chunks in different mm -hmm. magazines. It's so long, though. Gunslinger? I don't know. I thought the Gunslinger was one of his shorter. Oh, I mean ones. the series itself. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know Gunslinger. Yeah, I don't. Those are books I don't even want to own on my Stephen King shelf. I have all of them. Well, I have so one of them. Yeah, mm. I have all of them. So if you yeah. change your mind, <laughs> well, they're re they're redoing the Dark Tower series. This is the Mike Flanagan thing. Flanagan stuff. And, yeah, and you know I love Mike Flanagan and Stephen King. So you should think yes, Mans is into that. No, no, I don't want any part of it. It's, gonna it's ruin supposed to be like career. five seasons. It's so dumb. He's already working on that. Oh. <laughs> no, but, this, but that's going to be the thing that kills him. It's going to be his Heaven's Gate. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Not the cult, sorry. Oh, no, no, I got it. I got it, of <laughs> <Yeah>. course. <laughs> oh, I only know the cult. Oh, there's a, we can um, <laughs> look up the director, Michael Cimino. There's okay. a, like, Heaven's Gate is a famous, like, it's the first major flop of like, uh, it's like they changed the way that the studio system works because of how badly this movie went. Oh, no. And now it's having like a, a second life where people are like, well, it's, it's actually not that bad. Um, I don't but, know how you're going to. Anyways, I will not get into it, but we'll see. Well, mm. I, I wanted to say I was aiming to read the book for this episode, and I heard the book has some really diabolical parts to it, mm -hmm. uh, including doesn't Kathy Bates or that character get Paul addicted to yeah. Navro yeah. in mm -hmm. the book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are other things I think that are probably explained even better in the book. There's some big differences. So, right, so mm -hmm. I'd really like to, to read that sometime. But this is not Bibliophiles. <laughs> this is What Scares Us, and we're going to kick things off here. So this is the point in the episode where we warn you about spoilers. It's more than spoilers. We really go scene by scene through the movie discussing what we like and what we didn't like. And in my case, what confused me. <laughs> <laughs> so the story is basically an author who has just finished a novel and we see him doing his ritualistic three things when he finishes a novel. I think he has a glass of wine. He champagne. Has a, champagne. 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 Right. Dom Perignon. Right. <laughs> We're fancy. <laughs> right. He has this fancy champagne. He has a cigarette and he lights it. Aren't those the three things? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. 
So we see him finishing his novel, and he gets into his car, and he crashes spectacularly. He's driving a bit recklessly, it's, I have to say. It's insane. Yeah. It, watching that snow come down and how slowly his windshield wipers are moving, it's the fact that he's not even a little bit alarmed by that is insane. Yeah. Well, he's, he's like a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> One of the big themes of the book is that he's like struggling with addiction already. And so he had like spent some time trying to like not uh, partake, but then he's drunk at the beginning. Okay. And that's awesome. why he crashes. Yeah. See? That makes sense. Yeah. We would get a lot more out of this with the book. That's great. He crashes his car right after finishing his novel. And here we have a flashback with Lauren Bacall, where Lauren Bacall, his agent, is urging him to uh, write, excuse me, Lauren Bacall is urging him to keep the Misery series going, which he is not interested in doing. And this does seem directly related to Stephen King's life, even though I don't know him. I could imagine that mm -hmm. as a writer, you would want to do something else. Yeah. So we have The Crash. We have, uh, I don't remember Kathy Bates' character's name in the movie. Annie. Annie, of course, Annie Wilkes. Mm -hmm. Annie Wilkes comes to the rescue. She sees the car. She gets her crowbar out, pries the car door open with the immortal line, your legs just sing grand opera when you move, don't they? <laughs> 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 Which is... Such an awesome line. I just love it. And at that, um, there's a phone call to the sheriff that Lauren Bacall makes because she is worried. And I think this is the point where I wasn't sure how the sheriff character was going to go. Is he going to be a worthless sheriff who's just not doing anything? Or is he going to be a wily, clever sheriff who's wise to what might be going on? And it was kind of a relief to know that he's the wise sheriff. <laughs> he and his wife are my favorite characters. They're in this adorable. Whole thing. For sure. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. Every yeah. everything of them is really great, and you know they're they're not in the book. No. And um and I wondered if they were added to the movie to give the audience a sense that someone is actually looking for Paul to like lessen the dread of the story because the book is rough it's, it's depressing bleak as hell it's bleak as hell and you don't get any sense that anybody is looking for him at all and i wonder if they were they were added to i this is there's nothing to back this up other than my own my own dumb thoughts but i wonder if the studio had a note that was just like why don't we add some characters to soften this a little bit and rob reiner's pretty good at doing that so adding those two, uh, uh, the sheriff, Virginia and Buster, yeah. right? those right. are their names. <laughs> right. And they're hilarious. And they add like a little level of comedy and levity to the, to the situation that's otherwise like a fucking nightmare. Mm -hmm. I also think they add good tension because um, like the whole time you're wondering, like, I assume they're going to find him, but when and like how? Mm -hmm. And um by the time he later like gets to Annie's house, there's so much more tension because you actually care about this character and don't want them to like have a bad mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's the, in one of the documentaries about this, I forget what it's called. It did mention about adding those characters, but I forget the reason I watched the making of a while ago. Um, but those two, for me, those are like, like the quintessential, like Stephen King type characters that he writes in his books. Like I could see the sheriff and his wife, like just plopped into any any one of his books. I love that small town vibe that they had. And I love that Richard Farnsworth was who portrayed the sheriff. He's just so adorable. Like, especially when he's trying to find the, the, the card that's flipped over and he just like sinks in there and the banter between him and his wife is so good <laughs> yes. and charming. And <laughs> right. Yeah. Wasn't he in Anne of Green Gables? I know him from the straight story. Oh, Stephen, okay. or the David Lynch. Oh, he was in that. Yeah, I had no that's idea. like the most normal thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> to I me, think he was the, the kindly adopted father in the Anne of Green Gables. To me, Anne of Green Gables is only a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never seen the movie. Not doing that. Um, but I think it's a great opening 
I like that when he he finishes, he does his ritual, he gets in the car and the music is so loud. He's in this treacherous driving situation and the music is so loud. It's like upbeat and he's just bopping along. And as someone who hates driving in the snow and is so terrified, I'm just like, oh man, but wait, turn the music. Oh my God, what? And then of course he flips over. Yeah, yeah. it's it's a great scene it's with a, that it's car really good tension. going over the edge, flipping over and then just sliding down the hill like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love I also that. love yeah. that the first time... Like when when Annie Wilkes goes to get him out of the car, we don't see her face. We just see her body. I love mm-hmm. that the first time we see her is not her face. Yeah. Because her face is full screen so many times later. I just love that. I she think that was a great way. Carries like a way. sack of potatoes over, yes. over her shoulder. <laughs> oh, she's yeah. so Incredible. strong. Yeah. <laughs> this lady hey. is built. Yeah. <laughs> she's a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, at one point has handed over the new novel to Annie. And we learn about Paul's uh, traditional satchel where he keeps his single copy of each new manuscript. And at some point, Annie has started to read that manuscript. We see Buster, who now we know is on the case, Buster (laughs) the sheriff, and he's checking at the hotel. And... One of the next scenes is Annie making soup for Paul, and she is getting very upset reading the new manuscript because of all the language in (laughs) the new book. And she says, to make fun of Paul and the language, she, she says, she doesn't talk like this. Now, Wally, give me a bag of that effing pig feed and 10 pounds of that bitchly cow corn. (laughs) (laughs) This is the first time we really see that Annie is Mm -hmm. quite unhinged. She's like a kid learning to swear. uh, Bitchly was one that I wrote down in particular. Um, Hold on. I I found that, that entire quote. Is there a few other? Uh, that was where the big bastard of a check line yeah. comes in too. Well, yeah, <sighs> yeah. In the book, her since she doesn't swear in the book, a lot of her other words she uses for swearing is so much more apparent. There were some in in the movie, but in the book, it's just like cockadoody, cockadoody, dirty yeah. bird, dirty bird, like constantly. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit less in this, but it's still effective because you can see that she doesn't want to swear. She just you dirty, right. you dirty bird. <laughs> Dirty birdie. <laughs> it's so funny because, like, the first scene or two that she's in, I find her actually quite likable. Mm-hmm. Like, all the little, like, turns of phrase. I just, I think that's so funny. But um, I was confused at first because I couldn't figure out how she found Paul. But there's a later line where she says that she was following him since the hotel or wherever he was mm-hmm. before. Right, and she would see his light be on and then and yeah. yeah yeah so she was paying close attention to because she's his number one fan yeah she was so she knows before. she knows that he goes to the hotel to write and like she knows his ritual mm. so this made me wonder if stephen king is drawing directly from experiences he had as a writer and problems that he had with a number one fan at some point oh, oh it's gotta be i'm sure yeah i'm sure there are some like kooks in his life that, <laughs> right. that are aware of his you know stuff like this right um the scene where annie tells paul that she loves him i have a note here where it's Oof. like Ugh, this is like every parasocial relationship ever <laughs> it's really yeah. creepy like watching her character develop and the book is a little more um it's more apparent like the claustrophobia paul feels and like the both what's going on in both of their heads it's darker and here it's still you're still once you realize that she's not the nice person who rescued him and is making him soup she's got a lot going on and she becomes more and more unhinged and it's fascinating and he's just strapped to this bed he's just in this bed with these busted legs oh, his, his legs, legs look are, so fucking bad they're dude. gross so whoever did that prosthetic work <clears throat> uh should have also won an award and i love that pan down them yeah. you're just like oh god oh. i know it's very good yeah it's that's horrifying to just look at your body and think what is wrong here and he does such a good job of selling the agony that he's in mm-hmm. at any point where like whether it's when he falls out of the bed or when 
like she's moving him. Like he does a really good, uh, James Con rules. And I don't know. I can't think of too many movies after this that I really, really love him. I guess Elf. Elf, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but and I'm sure I'm I'm overlooking somebody, but man, he's he's also really great in this. Yeah. I only know him from Elf as, as Papa Elf. Yes, Buddy's dad. You should uh, you should watch the movie Thief. Thief. Um, yeah. It's Never a, heard of this. It's a Michael Mann movie with a young James Caan. It's terrific. Huh. Um, and also the the first Godfather, he's really good. I was going to say he's oh. in the Godfather. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I've seen the first one. But I don't remember a thing about it. Well, he's he's great. He's in a lot of really great stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I brought. Um, <laughs> this is a visual gag, so sorry to everybody listening to this, but I own three copies of Misery. Hell yeah! Um, I, I have collect that exact one. Viking copies, and so this is the same cover as um, the hardcover one that I have. But the hardcover does not have this insert, Ooh. which is a picture of Misery's Return. And the guy, it's like a romance novel cover, and the guy is Stephen King. It is. Oh, my gosh. No that's shit. Hilarious. Is Isn't that a amazing? dinosaur behind them? <laughs> a dinosaur. I can't yes. tell what I'm looking at. I have no idea. Isn't that wild, though? Oh, that's fantastic. That's, really cool. <laughs> that's so cool. I wonder if that existed like as a poster or if they printed posters of all the Misery books. I might need to, like... Put a, a screen grab of this on the node when we publish this episode because that it. is so great. <laughs> I've not seen that. Damn. Yeah, it's only in this um, like crappy paperback copy that I bought from Value World in oh, 2010. World. And you can't find <laughs> his. You can't oh, find Stephen King books in any secondhand store anymore, except like Cell. You can find a lot of copies of Cell. Ooh, which nobody wants. No. <laughs> Well, Buster and Virginia are out on the hunt looking for Paul, and they almost find his car, and we get a little glimpse into the Buster-Virginia marriage, (laughs) where Virginia has her hand on Buster's knee, and Buster is not having it, because when you're in this car... It's the sheriff's car. <laughs> and you're my deputy, right? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I love her line where she says, like, and the deputy would rather be at home under the covers with the sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like the it's like the Jaws we want to fool around thing. Uh-huh. A, little, a little bit. <laughs> that's a little bit. <laughs> and we're starting to see that the roads are clear. And uh, Annie has bought the newest Misery book, and Mm -hmm. she is over the moon ready to read that. Right around this time, we're beginning to doubt her sincerity that the phones are out, the roads are out, and that she will do everything she can as soon as she can to get Paul to a hospital and get him out of the house. So right around this time, we're really getting the sense that trouble is brewing because we as the viewer already know that this is the last Misery book and that Paul has killed Misery in some way that she's not able to come back from. And Annie is progressing through the book. She's Paul's number one fan, and we know there's going to be trouble. So Annie says, I'm right at the end and gotta find out what happens. <laughs> and then we get to a scene at night and Annie opens the door and says, you dirty <laughs> bird. <laughs> Man. She, th- 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 at this point, I think that my note, yeah, my note specifically said, God, Kathy Bates rocks. Like she, Her turn at that point is scary. You can, you can tell that she's going to react very poorly to it in the lead up to it just because of how, I mean, she acts like a child. Like mm-hmm. she acts like a weird child, like a weird, sheltered, hyper-Christian child. Yep. And, um, and he just kind of has these nonplussed reactions to her probably because he's in a lot of pain and he's on – on the Norville, yeah, no, yeah, whatever, or Navril, um, sorry, yeah, and um, yeah, her turn there though, it's like that. That alone could like could be what won her the Oscar because it's she suddenly becomes scary mm-hmm. and like a threat. Yeah, she's so menacing, and it's like a, a flip of the switch. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can tell also that she has truly no intention of ever letting this man go, especially when she's like, oh, yeah, I just talked to the doctor at the hospital and I talked to your agent. It's like, well, first of all, how the fuck would she even get the number for the agent? But, um, yeah, it's just so she's, wild. She's got the gift of gab, though, so she's able to, like, take advantage of the fact that he's mm-hmm. kind of woozy and just and just she has an answer for everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, she has fully built a story in her mind of what is happening and how everything is okay. Yeah. But I, I also I really enjoy the the visual because when she's on screen it's like her whole face is on screen and it's like from Paul's point of view so this low angle looking up at her so she looks even bigger and larger than life so you can feel her presence of like whatever's going on in her mind it's so good and it it's it's not scary but it's definitely like as a viewer you're like oh my god what is she gonna do now because now that she knows misery's dead I mean uh, I mean it's gonna go off the rails pretty soon mm-hmm. It's scary to me because she's so volatile. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't know what you're going to get from moment to moment, and she can just, like, no. turn on yeah. you. It's like your alcoholic father who is joyful one minute and playing and then screaming the mm-hmm. next minute. Mm-hmm. Not my father. Yeah. Yeah. Did anybody, <laughs> None did of anybody watch any of the behind-the-scenes stuff that talks about diagnosing Annie Wilkes? It was only on the Blu-ray. Okay. I did at one point. But there was. Um, I did watch that. It was kind of short. And there's a forensic psychologist who, again, is just watching and reading and guessing. Um, He says that Annie is a composite of what could go wrong with a human being, psychotic, bipolar, personality disorder, sadomasochism, false moral standards, delusions. There's also grandiose, impunity, manic, depression. So... Yeah, she's she's got it going on. Yeah. She, does, she, has a, yeah, she has an interesting concoction going on. Well, and that's how you can kind of see her go from light to dark. Yeah. You know? Yeah. She's more than an obsessed fan. So right about this point, I really started to feel that just the utter helplessness and hopelessness of the situation. Mm-hmm. Annie at one point leaves, and Paul is just looking at the door and the door feels like it's the moon. It's so far away. It's so unattainable. His legs are still all smashed up. He's in so much pain. Uh, even at this point, I think his arm is still in a sling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's such a struggle to think about getting to that door, let alone getting out of the house. And Annie even says, I never called anyone. She admits to that. And she says, if I die, you die. Mm-hmm. Right. The book is really good for this too because you get so much insight into Paul's state of mind and like mm-hmm. what he's thinking. And it's that same sort of um, uh, hopelessness that's in like Gerald's game where it's like you are trapped and there's mm-hmm. not a thing you can do about it. And to me, um, the part where like my heart started sinking was the first time he looks out the window when she drives away. And just looking at how much space it is from the front door to the edge of her property. Like, this man is never going to be able to crawl that Mm -hmm. distance. Like, he's not going anywhere. No, because even if he gets out of the house, he's just going to be in the snow and freeze to death. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, Paul does crawl and kind of fall out of bed. Uh, Yeah, his feet and legs really look terrible. And I think this is when Annie puts him back in. Uh, can I just say, Paul is super sweaty here. Yeah. This man is dripping. <laughs> <laughs> and he also, he burned the manuscript already. Too. I was going to say the manuscript uh, got is, burned, right? That's a big, yeah, oh, big this is part. Coming up I thought it was right, next. Right oh, now. okay, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So uh, Paul kind of crawls and falls out of bed, and his Mm. feet and legs look terrible. Annie puts him back and decides that he's got to burn his filthy book. Paul tries to bluff his way out of this and say, well, it doesn't matter if I burn this book anyway. I've got a bunch of copies, and my agent has a bunch of copies. And here... Kathy Bates says, well, I did see you on Merv Griffin, and we all know that you've only got one copy. So to rid your mind of all this filthy language, we've got to burn it. And this is also such an unhinged scene. This was, for me, one of the truly troubling moments of the movie, 
to have to burn something that you've spent so much work creating and you're never ever going to get it back and it's gone forever now. This was hard to watch. For sure. And so he does burn it as the only way out of this situation. <laughs> and by the only way out, it's just the only way that he can progress and get food and get his pain medication and be taken care of. <laughs> when, when she's burning the manuscript and just repeatedly saying, oh, goodness, heavens to Betsy. Yes. I, that, like, that scene is horrific, but that made me laugh a lot. Still does. Pretty much everything that she says, like all of her super buttoned up stuff like that. Yeah. I was so stressed out because the fire is huge and then she brings it right yes. by the uh, curtains. Yeah. yeah, I was like, what the hell? The drapes caught on fire too. <laughs> the oh. place, yeah. There's, oh. There wasn't enough smoke in that room though. Mm -mm. Man. At some point, someone makes a reference to climate change. Did you get this? What? To yes. the ozone layer changing the climates and winters getting shorter. Yes. So the ozone layer was a big issue when I was growing up. I don't think it had anything to do with climate change. I don't think it was a separate climate issue or uh, atmospheric issue. But the fact that they're referencing climate change back in 1990, I thought was pretty amazing. Yes. Yes. You must not have watched a lot of Captain Planet as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> True, Captain Planet, and then also Letterman talked about it a lot on, on climate change. Shows. Oh, the ozone layer. I remember the ozone layer, like in the yeah. '90s when I was in high school. It was like heaven. You heaven forbid you bust out a can of aerosol hairspray. Don't you dare use that to poof your hair. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's all I think about when I <laughs> see. The only thing we were told is don't peel the outside label of two liter coke and pepsi cans because that styrofoam would release ozone oh what? my gosh what? is that real <laughs> probably, not. probably not it's just farm lore well obviously we all stopped doing it and we fixed the planet it's, it's not a problem anymore wow in 2024 i love that that was our education <laughs> hairspray and pop bottles <laughs> See, kids, you too can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see Paul who is stockpiling Navro, and he is putting them in his bed, and he wants to put those to some good use later on in the movie. He has a wheelchair that he's using. He is working on his new novel to try to bring Misery back. And he spots a hairpin on the floor, which will also come back for use later on. We get a nice product placement for Eaton Paper. I don't even know if that's a real paper <laughs> company or not. I think it might be. But Annie has cajoled Paul into writing a new Misery novel. And she's got a typewriter, has bought paper, and wants to set the author up to somehow bring misery back to life. And that typewriter doesn't have an N key. It mm -hmm. does not. Which, this, is, this is, has nothing to do with this movie. But I had a Sony Vio laptop when I was in high school that didn't have an N key. So Ooh. I got used to typing huh. uh, command paste. For N, I had oh. a I had a single document on my desktop that was that was a lowercase and an uppercase N in case I needed them. Wow, that's a lot of work. Oh, for my. years that's how I typed, like an idiot. Wow, yep. do you still feel like you need to do that, like on instinct? I could do it. Probably, I could probably switch right back yeah. into that. I don't well, have an Annie Wilkes to to fill in all the ends for me. Because <laughs> when Paul is typing, like when you get those overhead shots, you can see his doc, and there's no N, and there's all the spaces. He's just. I'm like, oh, that's a clickety clackety old typewriter. Of course, yeah, doesn't have right. a letter N. <laughs> like yeah. Ian is I A. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So Paul says that the paper smudges that he that Annie 
bought him. And so she has to go back to town, doesn't she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she is really cross here. She's not cool with it. And yeah. she sa she asks him if he needs a handmade set of writing slippers too. <laughs> that sounds great. Right. <laughs> and then says, you just better stop. Start showing me a little more appreciation around here, Mr. Man. Mr. Man. <laughs> Mr. Man. <laughs> She's ridiculous. It is like such a, another great example, though, of um, like that switching that's so like common in abuse where she instantly goes from like, oh, you fooler. Did I do good? And like a minute later, she's back to thank you for thinking of me. And then right. she leaves. Like that's, ugh. Yeah. And then she, and then she'll slip into this like fawning, like love thing for mm -hmm. him. That's like gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you do see Paul kind of figuring her out a little bit, and he begins to see what he can do in terms of manipulation to get something out of her, and to eventually like for him to get out of the room. So it's interesting watching that they they're both scheming and dreaming their own separate realities. Yeah. Yeah. James Conn also puts in a really good performance here. And I noticed in this section, because he's clearly trying to play along, but you can mm -hmm. also see that underneath he's exasperated. You can see he's terrified too. He's yeah. just like, what is she going to do now? Yeah. Well, he also just burned his manuscript, mm -hmm. his whole book. Oh, yeah. And now he's trapped and he's got to come up with a new book that's going to satisfy her. Mm -hmm. And he also he just doesn't want to write this book. Yeah, he right. killed this character. Misery is dead. Yeah, and Could, there's an adorable pig around. Oh, yeah. misery the pig. Yeah. That's right. I changed my vote. Misery the pig is the best character. Of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'll agree with that. Little cutie. <laughs> Well, Paul uses the hairpin that he found to pick the lock on his bedroom door, mm -hmm. and he starts exploring the house. He looks around, he knocks over a penguin and barely saves it, and he goes into the back, he finds all the prescription medication and steals a whole bunch, and then he realizes that he had better get back to his bed soon. This setup, the parallel race between Annie and Paul is great. So we see Annie in town getting in her car, driving away, driving back, and we see Paul struggling, struggling to get out of the kitchen. And his wheelchair is just a little too big. He's got to tuck his legs in. Everything is going so slowly. He's got to get back in his bedroom. He left the door open. He's got to close the door. He's got to get back in there. He's got to make that lock work with the hairpin. And he does. He just barely makes it back into bed. And I think this is another scene where he's sweating so much. I also have a note here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's, she's like, Paul, what have you been up to? This whole scene is so stressful. I you was bet. freaking out the whole time. Yeah. It's really effective. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then it's, when he knocks over the penguin. Ooh. Yeah. And I didn't register. I don't think I registered the first time that it, when he set it back down, he said it back the wrong way. Mm. Um, I, the dueling door locks thing that happens is is real great. The other thing that I loved in this section is when he was first trying to unlock the door, he kind of says something along the lines to himself like, well, you've written this a million times, so you got to be able to do it yourself. Yes. Like, And then it does work, and he goes, huh. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is real great. Right. And I think it's, I think it's bef just before this happens, there's one point where he's laying in the bed, and he can hear her watching, I think, Love Connection in the next room. And we get, like, a view of her bedroom. And her mm -hmm. bedroom looks like a like a 13 year old's bedroom oh. still. I don't, do you remember what I'm talking about when she's watching TV in bed? Yep. Like if you look around her room, it's just like, I think there's, I know that there's a Liberace photo ah. in the living room, but there's like posters and shit, like tiger beat looking stuff around wow. her room. But like, it's like, she's, she's like stuck in, I don't know what the time frame would be like early mid sixties. Maybe huh. it's like, she's, she has arrested development or something. Mm -hmm. I did. I did see she had a cute, like a chair with a table next to it. And it reminded me like, like my parents are seniors. It reminded me of their cute little nook where they just like camp out in their little corner of the world. As my grandma used to call it. <laughs> There's a, there, her house has a yeah. lot of cutesy little things. There's a lot of like spinster tchotchkes and shit, <laughs> but like it's, but it's, mm -hmm. 
I don't know. It's if, if if she wasn't so scary and crazy. She also has a lot of onions, I noticed, in her kitchen. What? So like a bag of like 10 onions, which I have a hard time using one. Maybe they're for the, the pig and the cow. Maybe, oh, that's true. For the animals yeah, or something. That's true. I think Kroger should just start it, start selling bags of bitchly onions. <laughs> bitchly onions. That's right. <laughs> With That's Annie right. Wilkes' yeah. face on it. Wilkes bitchly onions. And it's got and it has misery of the sow's face <laughs> on it. That's the sponsor of our, our show today. <laughs> bitchly onions. Yeah. <laughs> um Annie also says here that the main reason she's never been popular is because of her temper. <laughs> LOL. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. That, you might want to work on that. And doesn't yeah. d- doesn't she even like wonder if that's why? She's like, I wonder if that's why I wasn't really popular. <laughs> so, like she has a, like, this strange little bit of self reflection, but it's not meaningful. <laughs> It's pa- it passes quickly. <laughs> yeah. I also love that she says that Paul can name the grave digger after her in the new book. Yes. That's yeah. very funny. Yes. Buster is still out on the hunt, still <laughs> suspicious of what is going on. Adorably. So as the spring comes and the weather warms up and the snow melts, the car is found. And even though Paul's body is not found, Buster suspects that someone pulled him out by looking at the crowbar marks on the side of the car. Before we move past that, do you, did you notice who the helicopter pilot is? No. It's Rob Reiner. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. I totally missed yeah, that. Yeah, it's cool. I, I noticed it, the first time I noticed it was for this viewing, um, just because I was kind of looking around for stuff like that. But yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. That's great. So Paul gets an idea that seems right out of Gilligan's Island to (laughs) collect all the pain medication that he's gotten, and he makes a little pill pocket. And then he's typing, it's all wrong, because he's quite upset uh, at having to write this book that he doesn't want to write. So the pill pocket will come into focus a little later on. And Annie has another episode here. She is talking about, I think it's her first reaction to the new misery book that Paul is typing. Mm -hmm. And she does not like the way Paul has brought misery back to life. Mm -hmm. And she's remembering a story from her own childhood. (laughs) And she calls them, what does she call those movies? The The, series. It's like the She doesn't call them serials. She calls them. um, Something chapters. I don't remember. She has a word that I had never heard before. Yeah, I forget. And Paul, well, it seemed like Paul knew what it was, though. Paul corrects them to cereals, and she gets really mad. She's like, she says, I know what they're called. I know that, Mr. Man. Right. <laughs> For the chapter plays. The chapter, chapter, chapter plays. plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh. I'd never heard that expression before. So Annie is talking about the chapter plays, and she's remembering one about the rocket man. And she says, he didn't get out of the cock a car. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's, this is my favorite scene in this movie. It's my favorite stretch of dialogue. It's, 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 it's so funny. And my, my wife heard this from another floor of the house and started laughing because she didn't know what I was watching at first until she heard she didn't get out of the cock a duty car. God, it's just so good. <laughs> I like that she calls it cheating, too. I think about this quote a lot, actually, um, just in life, but I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. So from this, we gather that Paul needs a rewrite. So he's got to rethink how he's going to bring misery back to life. And Annie starts reading the new chapters of the book, and she is very relieved and delighted. So excited, she says, I'm going to put on my Liberace records. (laughs) And Paul suggests they have dinner together. Oh, Paul. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Love is in the air. 
Ugh. Dude, Kathy Bates is so amazing. Yes. Because she, again, she's, she's just spins. like so, uh, like, she's so excited. It's like very endearing. Um, but I love that she made this character like a fleshed out and um, like nuanced character because it would have been really easy to just have her be some like crazy murderer. Yeah. But she's not. She's got, um, I don't know, a lot of qualities to her, which makes her seem more like a human. Yeah. She's believable. She is. Mm-hmm. And like when she she has like a, we, I might be skipping ahead, but like she has the scene where she's depressed and she's just like totally single note. Flat, flat like yeah like mm-hmm. and it's you buy it it's mm-hmm. like everybody's been there and she kind of describes it perfectly and yeah she's ah, she rocks yeah, she has and, the blues yeah. the blues the rain right. gives her the blues yeah but like not to a small degree she is like on the edge of the fucking cliff yeah. during that scene it is so crazy yeah and you feel sorry for her mm-hmm. yeah sometimes right sometimes and especially really, in yeah. that scene yeah uh-huh. for sure for sure. Like in yeah. the book, doesn't she, when she gets this um, bout of depression, doesn't she like go to a cabin for like three days and leaves Paul in the basement? I think so. Oh, yeah. She like chains yeah. him up in the basement and then she goes to like some, her thinking cabin. She has like a name for it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. My grumpy place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, no, it's literally. Something, but it's something like that. <laughs> something oh, man, like that. I got to read the book. It sounds really dire. It's really good. You, you'll you'll like and it. And it's a short one. It's like 300 yeah. some pages. I oh. tore through it. Just like, skim with, through the misery plot. <laughs> oh yeah, the there are big sections of like of the uh, is it it's actually misery's return misery, or is it, it's one of the misery novels is interspersed. Yeah, and it's uh kind of sucks. But like <laughs> but it but it's also I don't know. It's you just burn you'll burn. Yeah, you'll yeah. love it. Misery's yeah. return. There's yeah. like a different font of like chapters yeah. from the book. Yeah. I see. And here for Misery's Return, we just talked about the letter N. The N is handwritten in. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, that's really cute. Oh, yeah. that's great. No, I think you should still read the book, Christopher. Yeah, right. you'll like it. Okay. It's, it's, it's well worth your time. And no, there's it's definitely a good. It's way scarier, too. Right. Like, the sense of claustrophobia and darkness where he's trapped and can't get out, and yeah. her presence is so large and he's so trapped in his head. The book also talks a lot about like how much he loves writing, which I think is, it's always cool when Stephen King talks about writing. Mm-hmm. He has all these characters who are writers. I love it. So, yeah. Recommend. Yeah, and there's and there's nothing goofy, really. <laughs> like you don't you you just you don't get any of the Buster in Virginia stuff. So just mm-hmm. it's yeah. dark. It's just dark. It's you're like dark. you're trapped with Paul and yeah. Annie. Great. <laughs> it's another mm-hmm. claustrophobia movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we get to dinner, and we understand that Paul is kind of playing Annie. And Paul says, "You know what would be great at this meal." would be candles, right? (laughs) Or no, Paul says, there are three things that I like when I finish a novel. And this is a call back to the very beginning of the movie where Paul wants, right? Am I mixing this up? Uh, yeah, not so well, later. It is like that is later. That's okay. when he finishes. Big mix up. No, no, no. It's okay, but that, but there is some emphasis. Th- there's something that leads to them drinking wine. Yeah, he yeah. says. He says, "I think I want candles. What would that's what would make this meal perfect? Because then she fumbles with the candles, right? And while she's gone looking for candles, Paul puts all the drug in her champagne, mixes it up." And just gets the the glass set back down on the table when Annie shows back up. She knocks over her glass and you just feel so crushed and defeated that his one attempt at escape has just been foiled. He sells that so well too. Like he just, it's like... Because he can't really react, but we can. You can read it all on his face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. just like shock. Yeah, right. Oh, and the toast. I thought this was great, and this is another thing that looks so apparent on his face. Uh, their toast is to misery, and Annie says to misery, and Paul says to misery, and I took <laughs> it as two very different meanings of misery right. here, oh, definitely. which was great. They do that a few times in this, and I I really like it. Right. Uh, question for the guys on the podcast, because Amanda and I don't eat meat. 
uh, spam mixed with beef and fresh tomatoes. Her, her, the, <laughs> the Annie style shit where she's putting spam and everything. Like, no, it, I think that I, it, it's like, I think that's maybe to make her seem simple. And I mean, and it works, but no, <laughs> there's one, th- oh, I'm, I'm forgetting what it's called, but there is a thing that you can get. Hold on. I'm going to look this up. I wonder if that's in, you know, there's that book that's Stephen King related recipes. Oh, yeah. I wonder if there's one in there for like Annie's meatloaf. I have that on hold right now. I checked it out, but there's so much meat in it. I was just like, <laughs> I wanted to read the stuff before and after the little recipes. There is the only thing that I've ever had spam in that I have appreciated is masubi, which is like a, it's essentially it's a thing that I, I know that you can get it in a bunch of places. But I first had it in Hawaii because it's like a delicacy there. Spam. Mm-hmm. It's big in Hawaii. Um, and it's essentially like it's kind of like a big piece of sushi. It's like sushi rice, a uh, spam, and then seaweed wrapped around it. And oh. it's just like a, it's a strangely really tasty thing. But spam is, I don't know what to say about it. It's not good. I never buy it. I never seek it out. And yeah, I I I take the inclusion of spam as being like the thing that she when she jazzes a, a recipe up by putting <laughs> spam in it. It just that's because she's simple. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, this episode is not brought to you by spam. Right. No, <laughs> or or eating paper. Although I saw a spam a new spam commercial the other day, so they're 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 firing the marketing <laughs> wheels back up. Oh, man. I've always side eyed that and those like Vienna sausages. I've never had either. Same but... class of like it's mm-hmm. not really it's food stuff. Yeah, they're little, you know, quote unquote meat things in yes. a can. Yeah, that you could eat. Just yeah. put them in your bunker for when you need food later. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, also, this is not related to anything, but it turns out occasionally uh, dolphins do eat jello because it's an easy <laughs> way to get um, medicine, water. Water? Mm-hmm. Oh. Huh. Isn't it's that an wild? It's easier way to get water. Like easier if they're than dehydrated. opening your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Yeah. No, I'm because serious. I don't know. <laughs> well, but jaws. salt water. Yeah, we were. Yeah, oh. we were talking about this when we were in Jaws, Jaws. two. <laughs> no, Jaws, it's in um, Jaws three. Three, right? No, or, it's in uh, Flipper. Oh, Flipper! <laughs> Flipper. Fli- right, right. <laughs> yes, we were. Yeah, somehow we got on to talking about giving a dolphin. It's jello. a main plot point in that. Also, I bought that on DVD like a week after. So oh, good. If you guys need to borrow it, let me know. <laughs> good. <laughs> anyway. Just put it in the cover with the spam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we see Paul typing a lot and he's lifting his typewriter, which at first puzzled me. And then I realized he's getting his arm back in Olympic shape oh. with this heavy, heavy, heavy typewriter that he's pressing or snatching or pulling. Oh, dude, I, those things are heavy as They well. are heavy. Yeah. And I obviously don't know my uh, Olympic wrestling uh, or my Olympic weightlifting terms. <laughs> Jerk, snatch, lift, whatever they are. <laughs> oh, I'm an Olympic expert, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Annie has the blues. And this is a great scene. I think it's raining and Annie is really quite out of it uh she's pretty depressed and uh she doesn't know what to do with herself paul takes another little trip around the house when annie is out and realizes that annie is a murderer Uh, paul is looking through an old stack of uh, newspaper clippings in a book and Paul realizes that she really has a terrible, terrible, murderous past of children, I believe. Babies. I remember, of babies. Babies. Lots of yeah. folks, really. Her dad. Yeah. And lots of people. Yeah. She right. got and a her promotion husband. because somebody died. Right. Right. It's like her history. Something like, at, as far as we can tell, at least 70 people she's probably killed. Oh, that's a Think. lot. Something like that. Yeah. One is quite a few. One <laughs> is too many. Right. <laughs> Paul steals a knife from the kitchen. And my only criticism of this whole movie is when Paul is practicing bringing the knife out very suddenly, you 
you hear this metallic knife sheath sound like he's drawing a, a sword like he's a knight that's coming out of a metallic sheath yeah. swing it's like, swing it's like when a car peels out on a dirt road <laughs> right, exactly yeah. it's the same thing yeah. gotta love the foley yeah. right <laughs> So that's my only criticism, really. Well, that's not bad. That's not bad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask something. I'm looking at a note that I have that I don't understand now, which is it's, it's a bunch of laughter, <clears throat> and then it says the benches phone call. Do you guys remember a phone call? He gets about- a phone call, and somebody's bitching about somebody sitting on a bench outside of their business, and he's like, you you put a bench outside someone's oh. person, and no, I'm not going to tell him to come over there and get up. Oh. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the guy complaining about the kids, or the the thing in Jaws about the kids karateing the fences. Right. The yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Uh, small town busybody stuff. <laughs> Annie drugs Paul, and I don't remember why this time. I think it was because the sheriff stopped by the first time. Is that right? She, he gets drugged a couple times, doesn't he? Yes, twice. Right. That's what I thought. So the first time he's drugged. Oh, it's for the hobbling. Yeah. I was going to say the first time it was for that because, yeah, because later he gets shoved in the basement when the. um, Mm -hmm. That's right. She appears and there's thunder and lightning and then she drugs him and then when he wakes up, she's got the thing. Right. 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 Yep. And she reveals that she knows he's been exploring the house. She found the knife. The penguin was facing the other direction. Boy, so she is pretty attentive to her Hummel figurines and her creamware Tobies. And the, the, weren't there, there were like uh, marks on the doorway from the wheelchair that she also noticed. Was that right? Didn't she say something about that? Or like, if it's not in the movie, it's in the book. It's in the book. I remember, okay. I remember that it, too. Yeah, it. there were marks yeah. on the door. Right. Yeah, there should have been marks because that was a struggle to get through the door. Ram jammed through there. Right. Not ADA compliant. No. <laughs> and we get a little cute story about the Kimberly Diamond Mines right before the hobbling scene. Uh. I have to say, coming so late in the movie... And I hadn't seen this in a long time. This was more disturbing than I remembered it being. And the movie is already very tense and very gripping throughout the whole thing. And then this happens. (laughs) And you're like, this guy is good and truly fucked. Yep. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. If he couldn't get out while he was healing and he couldn't get out by drugging her... Well, he's never going to get out with two busted off legs or feet. Yeah. 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 In the book, she just chops off one of his feet. Yeah. She like cuts it off and then she cauterizes it with a torch. And it's disgusting. She blow torches it. Yeah. It's awesome. That's how I learned what cauterization is as a middle schooler. (laughs) (laughs) It's much, it's, it's so much worse. Oh my God. I almost think it's better. Because yeah. it'd be better to me to have a stump that is at least like uh, cauterized so that it, it's You're worse done. to me to look down and my feet are facing the wrong direction and there's nothing I can do about it. Ugh. Well, and you were, my God, you were like, I don't know how far along in healing he was, but he definitely was uh, well on his way. And then to start, like, to almost be put in mm-hmm. a worse situation. Ugh. Yeah. I love the setup. And again, the point of view of him in bed. In, from his eyes, you look down, you see her putting the, the chopping block in between his two, and then she holds up the mallet. And the first hit, we see his foot go sideways. But the second hit, our eyes are on Paul's face, which is even more impactful. It's yeah. so good and so gross. And she's just, she's lost it. She's completely, she can't. Oh, it's so good, though. Yeah. I also love the music in the background. Yeah. I think it's, is it Moonlight Sonata? I don't know. I th- uh, something like that, yeah. It, oh, that scene is. No, oh, she's tough. she's pissed. She is pissed. She's not having him running around his house. Mm-hmm. To be fair, I feel like I also would notice if things were not in the spot I left them at my house. For fucking sure. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, related to like the little bit of backstory that we get about Annie, 
Um, I highly recommend the f- uh, two seasons of Castle Rock, the TV show, um, especially if you are a Stephen King fan, because it's kind of like they put a bunch of like Stephen King stuff and put it in a blender. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Uh, the first season I wasn't super satisfied by. Um, I actually wrote about it in my staff picks whatever year it came out. Oh, but yeah. Then, I, I read that. I remember yeah. yeah. <laughs> then the second season I loved, and of course, then they fucking canceled it. Yeah. But I enjoyed the series. Did you watch it? Yeah. The second season is all about Annie. It's um, her before any of the events Neat. of this movie. And it's uh, she's played by Lizzie Kaplan, who is incredible. Oh, wow. I like in her it. a lot. That's she's cool. She's really good in it. Um, highly recommended. I don't. There were a couple things that I thought were maybe different in the little bit of backstory that we get here as opposed to the second season of Castle Rock. But Mm -hmm. uh, along with a lot of the other references, they sort of are playing like fast and loose with the rules. Like it's set in the present day. So that's already like I think I and that was a while ago when it came out. I think I like season one more than season two. I did too. Um, It wasn't my favorite thing ever for me. It was fun to watch just to see all the Easter eggs and to see how they were going to mash everything up. It's yeah. got a ton of um, other folks who have been in Stephen King stuff. Like Tim mm-hmm. Robbins is in it. Um, nice. Who's the guy who plays Pennywise in the new Tim It Curry. movies? Oh, the new ones? Yeah. Um, uh, it's one of those Skarsgards, Scar- isn't Scar- it? Scar- is it Bill? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Bill Skarsgård. Yeah. Um, Andre Howland's in it. He was just in Was the guy who was American in It? Story. Was the guy who was in the original It in it? Tim, Tim Curry? Curry? No, definitely not. No, he not, had a stroke. No. Um, he Mike? did? Yeah. Yeah. Like pretty life changing. Like oh God! I think maybe ten years ago. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. He still does stuff. Like yeah. he's gone to some like conventions and stuff, but his life is different. For it's sure. sad. It's very sad. Anyway, highly recommend Castle Rock, and especially season two. Like season one, I was kind of on the fence about. Season two, I was like all in is afterward. It, I didn't like the end of season two. Oh, really? Is it mm-hmm. on something? Is it on like Paramount Plus or mm-hmm. something like that? Well, I don't know, but we have it on DVD the, here yep, at the library. The library has it on yeah. DVD and Blu-ray. Nice. Season one and season two. Oh, and Annie's on the box for season two. Yeah. She's amazing. And she does all the like same like cock duty Like she's got all the same little phrases and stuff. It's yeah. a really good performance. Nice. Nice. 2019 it looks like it came out. Cool. Or 2018. Dang. Wow. Our sheriff is still on the hunt, and he <laughs> is more dedicated than ever to finding out what happened to Paul. Now we see him reading all the misery books that he can find, and he even visits his local library <laughs> yes, he does. to find out whatever he can. He finds a quote from misery in the paper even, and that's what leads him to pay a visit to Annie out on the farm. So he visits Annie, and this is another scene when Annie bursts into Paul's room and drugs him again to keep him quiet while the sheriff is in the house. The sheriff leaves, and he is just... On wait, what happens here? He like the, just gets out of the house, and then he turns maybe, around. He hears Paul he making hears a noise, Paul walking in, around with the barbecue downstairs. That's right, smashing that. Yeah, and he walks in the door. He can't find Annie. He opens up the basement door, and <laughs> we see Buster. Get shot. Get fucking blown away. Yeah. Blasted through the chest. <laughs> yep. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I love the the shot of Paul at the bottom of the stairs. So the sheriff sees Paul. Paul's like, yeah, I'm rescued. And the cop's like, yes. And then... Good squib work. Hole too. through the chest. And you see again from Paul's point of view, uh, mm. every chance that man gets yep. just gets snapped away. Yeah. Sorry, Buster. Oh, poor Buster. Poor Virginia. She's got to. Oh, what's she going to do? Yeah. She's got to become sheriff. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, she would be a great sheriff. She'll be fine. She'll be fine. (laughs) They'll be in good hands. So hot. Now, here, I don't remember. How does Paul get back upstairs, or do they have a fight in the basement? Annie. Annie brings him back up because he has to finish. Like, she's. 
says something to him about like a murder suicide, but then he's like, but I need to finish this mm-hmm. book first. Oh, yeah. That's right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. He, and, he t- he, she talks him into it. Yeah. Right. And then he does finish the book, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. And they have a big fight because he, I think he smashes her over the head with well, the- he, well first he, so he holds, he kind of like holds the story hostage because he finishes it. And then when she goes to get the the three, three items, things. the That's Dom Perignon right. and the match and the cigarette, when she comes back, he has doused it in lighter fluid and is ready to light it on fire. And she, uh, yeah, then the fight begins and she calls right. him a poop. <laughs> you poop. Right. Oh my God. She calls him a cocksucker at one point, which yeah. I was impressed. That's a lying right. cocksucker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You lying mm-hmm. cocksucker. <laughs> and I, doesn't he s- try to stuff? He stuffs a bunch of the burning pages into her mouth. Right. Here, you choke want it? it you, bitch. you want it? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Eat it until you choke, you sick, right. twisted fuck. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Let which, loose, buddy the elf sad. Yeah, which is a nice reference back to... What? Alien. <laughs> what? Did they just sort yell of you, yeah when because they yell of the, you the, bitch? the weird magazine the thing? magazine yeah, that where he's oh. trying to stuff ashes oh. choking That's her right. in that really strange way in Alien. Yes, yeah, wow. so disturbing. I didn't. I never put that together, but you're right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I never. So upsetting. Yeah. Then the, the fight kind of continues more, and then. You said earlier that there was only one quibble that you had with me. The only thing that I have with this movie that I that I really noticed this time is how bad the dummy looks when she falls onto the typewriter. Oh. Like when she hits her head on it. It doesn't matter. It no, Nobody should care about that. But like if you watch it again and you watch that scene when she falls down and hits her head on it, look closely at the dummy that looks <laughs> like just a just it's like a dummy for like a different person. Oh, I didn't oh. even notice any of that. Yeah. Wow, yeah, I didn't notice I it I thought either. the fight scene was, and there were a couple separate moments that were happening, but I thought it was really well-paced, really timed. It was very suspenseful. And when she hits her head on the typewriter, you're like, okay, cool. She's yeah. out, and then this is his time. And he goes to escape, and then there she comes back. And she is just, her face has blood all over it. And then at the end, what kills her? The metal misery, pig. Misery the pig. Yeah. Misery kills her. Right, right, right. right. Uh, it's what I like about it, and they mentioned this in one of the behind the scenes, was there was something sort of like sexual about it because it's like they're in this tussle. There's something so like this build up, this climax of this insane thing. Because when they're done, they're both just like they're writhing around on the floor. And at the end, there's just like this release. And it's so Oh, it's so good. Yeah. It's, it's really so brutal. intense and yeah. gross. And when he's trying to gouge her eyes oh, out. Oh, I yeah. love it. I, I had to rewind and watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones all over <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. It was just terrible. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great scene. It's a really great scene. Oh, I also love how he uses his hobbled leg to trip her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really funny to me. Um. Oh, uh... In the book, the sheriff doesn't get shot. It's just some random police guy or something, and he gets run over by a lawnmower that Annie is riding. Oh, right. I forgot about the lawnmower. It's a little more (laughs) ridiculous. I guess they filmed it, and Kathy Bates was, like, bummed that they didn't use it, but I don't really see how they could have done that. Oh, man, I hope that footage exists. (laughs) Lawnmower man. That's cool. Oh, God, what a weird fucking book that is, or <laughs> story movie yeah. the oh, oh man, i didn't you know the, it the the movie man that's like that's probably the worst stephen king adaptation it's Wait not a minute. the worst that's a stephen king it's story? not the, you would Wait, yeah, one more, more man, man? Yeah. everything is freaking yeah. see <laughs> perfect example what would you amanda what would you say is the worst the worst adaptation yeah oh my god the i don't know layers. <laughs> Langoliers. Oh. I actually haven't seen the Langoliers. I think I've had it checked out for a long time. I was uh, really freaked out by um, the story, and then I saw some clips of that, and I was like, "Fucking no!" It's, it's, it's bad. It's, it's made for TV, isn't it? Yeah, it you can shows. tell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, also in the book, Paul doesn't kill Annie. She dies in a barn. Right. She's trying to escape through a window or something. Yeah. Oh, Dreamcatcher was pretty terrible. Oh. Wait, she dies in a the barn. The Tommy Knockers. Yeah. Oh man, that might be my least That's favorite. That's a movie. Yeah. Is the book any good? I didn't read the book. Okay. I'm not going to read the book. 
It's aliens, right? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Mm. But some of the times they're so bad they're good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sleepwalkers was terrible. Wow, I haven't even Act heard of pupil. these as I know. movies. Yeah, yeah, they're all, every single thing you can think of. Everybody always tries to mm-hmm. make something of his. Is, aren't they doing a Life of Chuck yeah. adaptation right it's now? Mm-hmm. Flanagan. Why? Why are they doing that? I don't know. What, dude, That's what a is weird Flanagan one doing? Uh, anyway. You should just like <laughs> move in with Stephen one. King and just talk about stuff instead of having to adapt everything. That's a good idea. I'm going to call him up after the show. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Mike, Steve, I got an idea for you. We'll, we'll patch him in on Info Mike. 5 on this podcast. <laughs> well, we're going to fast forward to the end of the movie. Aww. And Paul is handing... No, uh, Paul is having lunch with his agent. And I think she is handing over the first printed copy of his new book that has nothing to do with misery and I think has nothing to do with the first manuscript that was burned. Yeah, I forget what it was called. The Education of Someone, someone yeah. right? Oh, the the other the first book he was writing. No, the, the book. whatever it is that he turned that he, like he turned in and actually got printed at by the end of the movie. Oh, um, eighteen months later. Yeah, his first like non misery thing that actually got pressed. I forget what it was called. This is another difference from the book because he actually does um, publish Misery's Return in the book. Oh, okay. Because people are super interested based on what so he went through to. Yeah. He doesn't burn it. Uh, there are other copies of it or something. I'm impressed oh, you can remember he, all the differences, Alice. He pretends to burn it in the book. Oh. So he's having lunch with Lauren Bacall and. He looks over and the waitress is coming down the hall and it is Annie Wilkes. Just for a second. Very freaky. Right. And she says, I'm your number one fan. And that's the end of the movie. Before we get to the very end, though, I think there's one line that I'm a little bit curious about in this scene. When his agent hands him the book And Paul says, you know, that whole experience really kind of helped me. And I thought that's kind of an odd thing. It, no matter what kind of bestseller you get out of this experience, I just can't imagine something so horrific helping you get over writer's block, which he didn't have, or anything else. I, I, that line, I, did it help him like escape misery? I mean, oh, I guess he's that's able to publish something else. Because he's able to publish something else. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, maybe. that was kind of how I took but it. But he he already wrote a whole book beyond misery. But, but yeah. the book was published like this is like a year and a half after he right. got out of the house. So maybe this sort of I don't know. Yeah. It could be anything yeah, in that- in the book. He publishes Misery's Return. And then he has writer's block and can't write anything else for a long time. And then at the end, he finally starts something else and he like cries because yeah. his life sucks ass. But he is able to like continue as a writer. Yeah, well, like the a book, really, bit... the book oh. really focuses on like writing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought the agent was super shitty. She's <laughs> like, I thought you were over it. Like, excuse me? It's been a year and a half since I got kidnapped and almost murdered and yeah. watched a guy get blown in half, like, in front of me. Oh, I'm over it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. I'm fine. Because well, she asked him, like, would you want to write a nonfiction book about your experience? He's like, oh, relive the worst experience of my entire life? Yeah. Right. yeah. Just make money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's like just, it feels, it feels to me like a riff on what publicists are like. Yeah. See, I'm just blind to Lauren Bacall. So. Oh, yeah. And she's distracting. To me. <laughs> like, extremely distracting. To me. She was really good in this role, though, she's, for sure. She's great. This scene and the earlier scene with the two of them reminded me of Romancing the Stone, just because I recently watched that. Oh, Kathleen Turner, she's got that wispy voice, too. Yeah. Not wispy, raspy. And see, this Deep. makes me think of The Sopranos because she shows up for a second in The Sopranos. Oh, really? Do you remember that? Lauren McCall? I never watched Sopranos. Oh, shit. Yeah. Wow. No, okay. You're the oh, only one. Showed... Oh, I've seen man. some. But I've seen some, but why? She ha- oh, anyway, she has a. She appears as herself in The Sopranos in a. Uh, everybody should watch The Sopranos. <laughs> it's so fucking good. Anyway. 
All right. (laughs) 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 So what we've learned from this episode is spam is not great unless you really need it and you're in the military. It also needs to be like fried to even taste good. (laughs) And we should all watch The Sopranos. And Alien. Alien. Right, we should all watch Alien. <laughs> oh, um, I'm not doing any of those things. <laughs> this is from IMDb. I'll have so. some Annie's potatoes, though. Or onions. Onions, yeah. Man, I wonder what she would put in potatoes. Um, spam. Uh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Corn and chunks yeah. of spam. Yeah. Also, I would like a follow-up to see what happened to Misery the pig. I'm pretty interested to see what that little pig's life was like Got after re-homed. this. Yeah. Just like on a little sanctuary or something. I don't know why, but I, for a second when I was watching it this time, like I, I picked up on some sort of little intimation that like she fed people to her pig. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think, right? Isn't that, that's in the book, implied pretty because heavily. I think in the movie too, but. I, definitely in the book, because I think that after she um, runs that guy over with the lawnmower, she has to get, get rid yeah. of his body and well, she feeds yeah. him. But and there's then, something in her scrapbook that like, that. Because that the scrapbook, if you pause it and you look at everything that's going on on the screen, there's a lot of really fun little little nods and Easter eggs, and it's like there's something I don't remember exactly what it was, but there was something that made it seem like maybe some of those kids that were ki- like or somebody that she killed, she fed to to misery. Uh, it's great because misery is such a sweet looking little pig. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, this is from IMDb, so who knows if this is actually fucking real, but it says the theme music in one of the trailers for the film is actually a piece of James Horner's score from Aliens. That's true. Did you Ooh. notice that? Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, and it really sticks out to me. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. They, it's like, I think I, I remember maybe in the, one of the featurettes or something seeing that they just, they hadn't finished any of the, like, they didn't have any finished pieces of this score yet. So they were just they were optioning just something else that the studio had put out, which was James Horner's score. I think James Horner did the music. No, sorry, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Never mind. It all comes back. <laughs> to Alien and Aliens. That's right. They're the best movies ever made, you guys. <laughs> well, are we ready for our ratings? Yes. Oh yeah. And if you're new to the podcast, we have a very special way to rate our movies. The Scarameter is out of five stars, and the movie is rated on ten stars. (laughs) Who'd like to go first? No one. I can go. Okay. (laughs) So, uh, Scarameter, if I'm looking at just the movie, which obviously we Kind of are because this is a yes. podcast about movies. Uh, I would rate it. I would rate it on the lower side because I've never been particularly scared of this movie. However, I'm going to break the rules a little bit and say that my experience with this material, um, enhanced by my experience with the book, I'm a little more scared of it now because the idea of being trapped in someone's house and no one knows you're there and they are obsessed with you and they. Because they were a nurse, they have a lot of knowledge of how to drug you and keep you in place. That's scary as hell. But I'm gonna say I'm gonna say three out of five for its wow. scare meter. Um, that if if only for the hobbling, whether it's the movie version or the book version, and then the movie itself, I'm going to I'm gonna say eight out of ten. Um, I really like this movie. I think. Depending on the day, I would say it's probably the best Stephen King adaptation overall. There's really not much I would change about it. Um, Kathy Bates is great, well deserved um, Academy Award for her role. Love James Kahn. He's very cool. Um, he just kind of represents old Hollywood for me, and you don't see a lot of actors or like him in movies anymore. Sorry, that is the most boomery shit I've said. <laughs> but, um, Back in my day, but it's but it's true. I really like him in this, and uh, yeah, there's it, there's this movie is just a there's just a nice little bow on it. It's like a perfect package, and oh, it's under two hours. That yep. never fucking happens anymore. So yeah, eight out of ten, three out of five. I don't think I really like this movie. I think it's a really really great adaptation. Um, the book is good. The movie is good. I don't have any 
I need, I can't think anything I want to pick apart about the movie. I'll give it a nine out of ten. It's not like my favorite movie I want to watch all the time, but it's just really well done. It's a really great psychological thriller with some great acting and some freaky scenes. And I th- I think it's I think it's a fun watch. And it's also one of those ones where people have seen it and not realize it was a Stephen King property at some point, which I always think is fun. Um, so yeah, we'll give it a nine out of 10. I don't think it's, it's hard for me to just to sit here now after watching it recently again. I've seen it so many times. I first watched it like in the early nineties. I don't know what my initial response to what I thought like, the scariness level of it was. I don't think it's scary, but like thinking about like what Matt just said, what about it is actually scary and thinking about it. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think it is, does have some scary elements, but I don't think I'm particularly scared. And when I watch it, I'm not scared. I'm more mesmerized and like, oh, yeah. Like when I watch it, I know how horrible it is. Um, I'm just going to give it a one out of five, even though it is, you know, scary in the aspect of a, a human monster who is doing horrible things to many, 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 many people. Um, and I really loved how she dies in the movie. Lots of lots of good elements. Yeah, I but I still think Stand By Me is my favorite adaptation. <laughs> so there we are. I'm also going to give it one out of five. I don't find it that scary. I find it more like extremely tense mm-hmm. um, and gross. <laughs> I find it pretty gross. Uh, mostly all the leg stuff is just absolutely disgusting to me. Um, but I do think that there's something there. Um, so one out of five and then I'll give it eight out of 10. I really like this movie. I like that. Um, it is a horror movie, but there's like sort of a mass appeal to it where I feel like you could have a conversation with someone who isn't into horror and they Mm -hmm. might, you know, know about it or like it. Um, and it also just has like a really cinematic quality to it that i feel like movies today don't have like i I feel like i'm stepped into some other magical world watching this whereas other stuff just doesn't give me anything like that anymore so anyway i think it's super well done really great performances and one of the best stephen king adaptations of all time Mm -hmm. i think it's also the only one to have won an academy award of any kind yep Mm -hmm. not that that did you know that this was a this was like a technically holiday season release, and it opened against Home Alone? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they're basically the same. Yeah, kind of. Because <laughs> it came out at like the end of anyway. it was the end of November. It was a Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, yeah. So, because uh, I I I feel like I read somewhere like this Christmas spend spend it in misery or something like that. Was <laughs> that was wow. just the just, trailer. Yeah, that's awesome. Right. Yeah. Wow, maybe I'll make this a uh, like a winter Christmas movie. Well, yeah. I mean, this is kind of a feel good horror movie. Yeah, it it the, some, there was something Amanda that you were saying that like at, about what how it's not scary. It's all in daylight. It's so much this movie's bright and so much of it is Rob Reiner, like who doesn't make dark movies. This is probably the darkest thing he made, I would guess. Um Unless I'm forgetting, well, I guess a few good men is dark in its own way. But I think there are no jump scares in this whole movie. Isn't that true? There is a very light jump. I think when you when you see her getting ready to drug him the first time, where it's like the lightning cracks and you're right shows her face. But that, but I wouldn't call that a jump. There isn't like a that happens in the in the sound department or anything. Right. Yeah. It is more of a, th- it does feel a little bit more like a thriller than a horror movie. Yeah. But, oh, beautiful view out his window, too. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to give this a two on the scarometer. I actually found this, the desolation and the isolation uh, and just his, his horrible situation and also burning two manuscripts of his books. Oh, I found yeah. that really horrible and awful. Uh, so that's, I'm giving it a two on the scarometer. I think this is a great movie, and I'm giving this a nine because of Kathy Bates. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's tremendous in this. James Caan is great, but I really think it's it's all Kathy Bates. Her and her acting is really what 
uh, makes this movie for me. Nice. So I think we're ready to wrap things up. If you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thanks for joining us. This has been What Scares Us.